Joe, let's talk about the core of your research, which is the amygdala, this nucleus deep within the brain that you've shown has, is significant in the fear conditioning. But let's understand how that works and also how we can generalize to how human beings appreciate emotion. Well, so the thing to understand about the amygdala is that the reason it does what it does is simply because of its wiring. There's no myst mysticism about it at all. It's very, you know, it receives inputs from the external world, from all the senses, and then it connects up to responses that control our bodily physiology and so forth. So we have um, outputs of the amygdala control, blood pressure and heart rate, sweating, um, um, hormone secretions, all of the physiological signs that you have when you're highly emotionally aroused. The, the fight or flight. The fight or flight response, basically, yeah. And so those come out of this circular region here called the central nucleus of the amygdala. Mm -hmm. So that, it, that connects to the hypothalamus and to the brainstem and controls all of those responses. You've got one output going to the autonomic nervous system for blood pressure, heart rate, respiration. You've got one output going to a different part of the hypothalamus for the release of hormones from the pituitary gland, stress hormones. And a third output going um, to the periaqueductal gray, a region in the midbrain that controls freezing responses and escape behavior and so forth. How does it know in its original wiring that um, uh, it, it should be a fear response as opposed to something else. Mm -hmm. a, sort of a, a naive kind of question right. that, that you, you, you sort of want to ask. Right, so the amygdala doesn't know anything, right? <laughs> right. So it, it just gets right. electrical and chemical inputs. Right. And if, there's a, if, if the gate is opened by those inputs, so it's got a, the amygdala receives sensory information in its lateral nucleus, so that's the gateway in. So there's a lot of inhibition, inhibitory neurotransmitters in that structure that prevent normal stimuli from activating it. The cerebral cortex out here is activated by everything, but the amygdala is activated by almost nothing. Something has to open that gate. And there are two ways to open the gate. One is through genes or innate experiences, not experience, but innate uh, wiring that, that was put into the brain by evolution. So in the case of a rat, it's naturally afraid of a cat. In the case of people, we have innate fears of snakes and spiders because those were dangerous to our ancestors. And that's why those are common in phobias. Not everybody has a phobia, but we all have the capacity to learn about these dangers very rapidly. So we have these innate forms of uh, activation that, cross, that open the gate because of wiring. And we also have learning that allows, uh, allow us, learning allows us to uh, allow stimuli to open the gate because of past experience. So the rat that's attacked by a cat along a certain path in the woods uh, learns that that path is dangerous. So when it gets to that path, on its, when it's looking for food, it starts to be very cautious because the stimuli at that path location cross the barrier. They open the gate. And the way they open the gate is because learning has reduced some of that inhibition that prevents the stimulus from getting through. And, and how can we generalize from this to other kinds of emotions in, in the brain? The same sort of, of, of gating and learning experience and the combination of nature, the original right. wiring, and nurture what we've learned in our own experiences. So I think the amygdala example gives us um, a kind of template for then asking questions about other emotions. So it's very easy to study things in the brain if you have a stimulus and a response. And that's why fear has been so good because, uh, and so profitable for study because you have a stimulus that, that starts, in the case of a tone, it starts at the ear. So you can follow it through the auditory system. And then you have these responses, blood pressure and heart rate that are you know, wired in, in the connectivity. And you can follow the, the response out. So all you have to do then is connect the stimulus and the response in the brain, just connect the dots, mm. and you've got the circuit. Uh, if you don't have that, say, for depression, there's no stimulus and there's no response, so it's much harder. Or schizophrenia, there's no stimulus or response. These are states of the brain rather right, than, right. Uh, the, than conditions that are just elicited uh, by a stimulus. How about more positive emotions in human beings like love, yeah. uh, which have somewhat similar characteristics mm -hmm. that uh, we, we don't show it very often, but there'd be certain certain uh, stimuli that That's would trigger right. that, whether it's children or spousal? There is some work now on um, um, attachment 
uh, in mm -hmm. animals. So that certain voles, for example, um, will form pair bondings that they, that they keep for a lifetime, whereas a very similar form of vole, uh, genetically similar, that lives in a different location, doesn't pair bond. And so by studying the brains of those two kinds of animals, uh, you can learn something about the attachment uh, system and its role in, you know, romantic attachment in, in the uh, rodent. And what type of parallels can you see uh, in terms of general theory between fear in the amygdala and attachment, or as we might call it, love in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, adults? Well, I think that you know the uh, the positive emotions haven't been studied as thoroughly, uh, so we don't. They've been primarily studied in terms of the hormonal responses, mm -hmm. attachment behavior. So we need to get into the circuitry of that. But some positive emotion has been studied in terms of addictive drugs and the cues associated with addictive drugs that that elicit relapse behaviors and so forth. So that's a promising um, behavioral paradigm for studying positive emotion in the rodent brain. And so as we integrate it together uh, and we look at the totality of the brain, uh, how much of it or how important are uh, affective or emotional behaviors in terms of the totality of sentient life? Well, affective emotional behaviors are you know, essential to our entire being. Um, we don't do anything that's not affective in one way or another. Those are the things that move us. And so we need to understand our emotions uh, if we want to understand what it is to be human.